Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you folks for coming. Um, it's a, uh, I, I thought as I was driving in on a very sunny Monday morning, you know, when I was a student, I don't think I would have shown up for a guest speaker. So I hope you're getting some course credit for this. As you see, I want to talk about my life and career very briefly. It's not that interesting, and that's the part that I want to tell you about. Uh, I, uh, I want to talk about some tips for your success, uh, because I think that's the part that hopefully is most relevant to you. And then uh, lots of time at the end for uh, questions and answers, OK? So let's start off with, um, with my life and career. I'm about as local a guy as you're going to find. Uh, I grew up on King Street uh, between Hickory and Columbia. Uh, I, uh, the house is no longer there. Uh, it, I just drove by and it's gone. Um, uh, I, uh, I went to Northdale Public School, which no longer exists either. It's now sort of a satellite of Waterloo Collegiate, I think. Um, I then went to McGregor Senior Public, it was called. I went to Waterloo Collegiate and then I came here. So, so if I stood on the, you know, at the top floor of the tallest building when I was graduating, I could see my entire life. Uh, from one direction or another. Uh, I used to toboggan right out here. There was a hill, uh, there used to be a hill between sort of what's the library down to, I don't know what, it was a parking lot or something. I used to toboggan here. So, so I'm about as local <coughs> as you get. And, uh, uh, and I grew up in, um, uh, whoop, oh, that, that's not the way I'm done. Anyway, she told me to do it this way. Okay, so my early life, uh, that's my early life. What did I learn? Uh, I learned from my parents the value of hard work, uh, and uh, because they worked very, very hard indeed. And, uh, and I won't go through all the details, but, uh, but neither of my parents uh, graduated from high school, let alone university. And so, um, you know, but they worked very hard, and they made a very, very good life for uh, my family. Uh, and, uh, and I valued that. I also valued the fact that there were many roller coaster rides in our, in our family. Uh, things happen uh, along the way, and I, and I learned the value of a positive outlook because my parents definitely had that, and that has helped me tremendously in my life, and I hope you see that uh, in the comments that I make a little bit later on. I then joined Procter & Gamble right out of school. The year was actually 1978, so I was with Procter & Gamble for 33 years. Uh, I joined in marketing, uh, and uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I certainly didn't think I'd stay for 33 years. I thought I'd stay for a couple. Uh, and learn some things and then maybe move on to something else. Uh, but the challenges inside the company always seem to be even more interesting than the challenges outside. And so I stayed. And, uh, and, I, want, and I let you know that only because, so that you know that it's a possibility. Uh, it's a possibility to stay in one company for a very, very long time and have a really, really fulfilling career. Uh, and so the, how did I get the job at P&G? I use career services here. Uh, you know, every fall there's this complete smorgasbord, this, this wonderful smorgasbord of companies that come on campus and interview students and talk about themselves and so on. That will never exist again in your whole life. Never again will companies beat down the doors to try and get to you so that they can show you all the opportunities that exist inside of their company. If you fail to take advantage of that, you're crazy because it doesn't happen again. And so don't take it for granted. Uh, I took advantage of the career services um, um, your role on campus, the, the, the services that they offered, and it worked out for me. And from that point on, I was on my own, clearly, but um, it helped. It helped tremendously. So, um, <clears throat> who is this company that I joined? Procter & Gamble is a large consumer packaged goods company, consumer products uh, from all different, uh, in all different types of categories. We do business around the world. It's about an $85 billion company. Uh, do business in 180 countries, about 125,000 employees, and it makes products like these. So these, there's about 50 major brands in the company. Um, the company's existed for 175 years, it says. It's actually now 176 because the slide is, is about a, a year old. And uh, these are the brands that, um, uh, that, that are each a billion dollars or more in sales. Uh, so you may recognize some of these. Uh, this is Gillette. Uh, these products here are Gillette. Uh, Tide, you, you probably know, Bounty Towels, Gain Laundry Detergent, Head and & Shoulders, and Pantene Shampoo, uh, Pampers. This is Crest and Oral-B Toothbrushes. Ariel is sort of the Tide of Europe. Um, uh, more Gillette stuff. Imes Pet Food, Duracell Batteries, Downy Fabric Softener, Always Feminine Hygiene Products, um, 
Charmin Tissue. Pringles, actually, we just sold that business a few months ago. Uh, the company's no longer in that business. Whoops, I lost my cursor. There we go. Uh, Dawn, um, uh, uh, dishwashing liquid. Ace is a bleach that's sold in Southern Europe uh, and Latin America. Braun, uh, razors and kitchen appliances and so on. This product is actually a product called Calestone, which is a hair coloring product, part of the Wella. Uh, line of hair color products uh, sold in what Calestone is sold in Latin America. So, so those are the those are the products. Those are the billion-dollar brands. It's in a lot of different categories in a lot of different countries, and that creates opportunities for for guys that grew up in Waterloo. Uh, and uh, and so so that's what I joined, and that's where I stayed. My career early on was um, very much. Uh, a typical career progression, uh, early on and throughout my career. And I just make you, I expose you to this because I'm going to build on it a little bit later. I, you start off as a doer. No matter what you choose as your career path, you're going to start off as a doer. And that could be a financial analyst. In my case, it was a brand assistant in the marketing department. Uh, it's, it's not a flashy title. And you're responsible for sort of work that somebody doles out to you. And you have the power of one. You do work. You produce results, people either like it or they don't. They train you, they coach you, they advise you, they tell you when you screw up. But you, that's it, you do. And, and somewhere along the line, as you do, uh, somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, you're quite a good doer. Uh, we would like to make you a manager. You manage other doers. And so, um, and so you start to manage a group of people. Might be just one or two at the beginning. Grows to maybe six or 10, but, but um, you know, it's different than being a doer. It's very, very different. And, and so um, a lot of people can't make that transition. It's a difficult transition, frankly. Companies try and help their people learn for, uh, to make the transition from doer to manager. But it's not always easy. And a lot of people flame out right at that point, right at that arrow. They can't make that transition, and they don't do it very, very well. The important part is that in the business school, you talk a lot about managing. Um, but by the time you actually get to do it, you've forgotten what you learned. And so what business schools tend not to do, or schools in general, they don't tell you very much about how to be a doer. Uh, and so, and you, and so often, people are dissatisfied with being doers, having spent a lot of time talking about management and talking about strategy and stuff like that. Nobody actually is interested in your point of view about strategy when you're a doer. They actually just want you to do, and do really, really well. Okay? And so you've got to focus on that. When the, by the time you get to be a manager, hopefully you can make that transition. And, you're, and your, your sphere of influence grows as you take on more and more people. Um, and hopefully you, you, learn from doing, you, you learn from being a manager and you learn to do it better and better. And at some point, it's not, you're not, it's not possible to manage all the people that you've got reporting to you. And so you have to become, whoops, you have to become a leader. And so, and the skills, again, of being a leader are very different than being a manager. You're managing people that might be in a different time zone. You're managing people, you're, you're, you're trying to influence and, and inspire people who, uh, might, who have a completely different functional background than you. When I moved to England and I, I was the general manager of our health and beauty care business in the UK, um, I had, you know, PhD chemists working for me, and I had, uh, I had a doctor working for me, and uh, I had you know, people that had completely different backgrounds. Uh, and here I had a BBA from, from Wilfrid Laurier University, and they were looking to me to, for guidance and for leadership. And so it's a very different set of skills required to do that. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, these transitions are very, very difficult. Uh, and, it, and you've got to be able to change, to, to be a bit of a chameleon and become what is required at the next level to be successful. And, uh, and uh, somewhere along the way, I hope you get the opportunity to do that because a doer has the power of one. You have you, you know, the, the influence and the span of responsibility of one. A manager has, can, suddenly you have the power of 10 maybe or 12, the people that report to you. You have much more influence and much more ability to make change. But a leader has the has the opportunity for the power of maybe a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand people that might work for you. And suddenly you have this ability to influence things on such a bigger scale, it's tremendously fulfilling and rewarding. It's also a bit of a tight wire act and it can be, uh, can be a high risk activity. So at any rate, my career progression was typical. So I started, uh, as Dr. Kelly said, in Toronto in marketing, mostly in the laundry part of the business. 
We then bought a bunch of healthcare businesses. Um, we bought Richardson Vicks. Uh, we bought Norwich Eaton Pharmaceuticals. The company uh, bought the Metamucil business from G.D. Searle. And suddenly we had this healthcare, combination of healthcare brands, and nobody knew anything about healthcare. So they said, well, give it to him. And so they did. They gave it to me. And uh, I was given a, 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 actually a, a floor on our building that had just cement, uh, cement brick walls. Uh, and they said, start from scratch and see what you can do. And so I, I had a team of people, and we built a healthcare business and that, was, that was pretty successful. And uh, it included the P&G healthcare brands. And as a result of that success, I was sent to England. And uh, I ran the health and beauty care business. It was actually more beauty than it was health. Uh, but I ran the health and, a bigger business in a, in a uh, sort of a bigger pond and, um, uh, and, and uh, ran that business for, for a while. Best Thing I ever did in my life. The best decision I made was to, was to move internationally and to work in a completely different world uh, than what I had grown up in. It was a fantastic experience for me and for my family. My two boys were nine and six when we moved there, and my daughter was born in England. Um, and, uh, and then after a few years in England, they, they sent me to uh, the US to run the paper business, a business I really didn't know anything about. Uh, and uh, I learned how to, how to operate and be successful in the paper business. Very different scale. Had 8,000 people that worked for me. Um, I had, uh, it was a hugely capital intensive business, very energy intensive, very resource intensive in general, and, uh, and a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, and then from that, I was able to come back to Canada. When you get on that international merry-go-round, you don't always know where it's going to stop. And it doesn't generally stop where it started. Uh, but in my case, it did, which is good. It came back to Canada, and, uh, and I got to, to lead the Canadian operation for P&G for, for 12 years. Uh, and then, enough. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, I, I told the company with lots of notice that... Uh, that when I turned 55, I would take that exit ramp, and uh, and uh, uh, and I would I would retire and do other things, and uh, and that's what I'm doing. I'm doing other things, and I'm having a lot of fun at doing those other things, and we can maybe talk about that later. Okay, so enough about early career. Talk about tips for your success. I'm going to blaze through these, um, and the first one is uh, to set bold goals. Um, if we divide the room, and we have a business here that's been running at let's say 5% growth per year. And we set a goal for you folks, and we say we're gonna set a goal that next year we want you to grow by 5%. You'd say, well, that seems reasonable, we've been growing at about that pace, 5% growth, fine, we'll take that on. And if we said to the other side of the room, we want you to grow at 20%. Initially, you'd say, I don't think we can get there. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get to 20% growth. And, and maybe if we spent time, we could explain that it's imperative. We must have 20% growth from this part of the business. We need you to stretch. We need you to think outside of the box. We need you to do other things. At the end of the year, this group might have 5% growth. They might have been thrown a curveball by competition, and they might hit 4 Okay, I guarantee this group over here will do better. They will, because of, just by virtue of having the more stretching goal, they will think, this group will think out of the box, they will think of new approaches, new ways of doing business that they had never considered before, and they'll get better results. It might not be 20, it might be seven, but it'll beat this group. And so I would encourage you, no matter what it is that you take on, set for yourself really bold, really bold goals. You will run into people along the way that will tell you, no, no, it's all about sort of under-promise and over-deliver. You know, just set the bar just a fraction above where you are, and that way you can come crashing through the paper barrier and claim that you're a hero. It doesn't honestly work like that. It doesn't. What you have to do is you have to set yourself stretching goals that allow you to think outside of the box and come up with new answers that you'd never even considered the questions before, okay? That's how you get breakthrough results. And at the end of the year, people will look back and say, who did better? This group will have done better. Now, you, you, they're going to have to explain that their 20% goal is a stretch target, and they might not achieve it, and they'll have to manage expectations. But by putting in their brain that 20% is what we want, they will get better results. And that's where I would start. Just set for yourself bold goals. And as you do that, um, you need to do it. Whoop. You need to, to, you can't set bold goals across every dimension. Set bold goals in an area that is your company's strategic imperative, something important, okay? So something that's important to your company, 
that, re that relates to your job in your, in your, in your role, set stretching goals and really deliver for the company. And I used to, uh, in my past job, I like to speak to new hires on day one. And the one message that I, among the many messages that I, that I would depart to them, uh, I, would, I would tell them, please make a personal difference every day. When you walk inside the door of the building, whether you're coming up the escalator or whether you're walking in the front door, make a commitment to yourself to make a personal difference. To, to deliver for the company something great. So if you set bold goals and you make those bold goals in areas that are important to the company and then you make a commitment to yourself, I'm going to deliver every single day, you will. You will. It's as simple as that. And I know that sounds ex incredibly simplistic. It sounds like one of those things that should be on the cover of a self-help section of the chapters store, <clears throat> but it actually makes a difference and I'd start there. Just absolutely set bold goals. Okay, so. What else? Second thing, embrace change. Change happens all the time. Some people would say it's happening at an ever-increasing pace. And the reaction to change is interesting. Very often the, the reaction is denial. I deny that there is any change actually occurring. Or to be crushed by it. Oh my God, things are terrible. I'm being crushed by these changes. Uh, or, or maybe to, um, to be, you know, you could be crushed, you could be threatened by it. <clears throat> My recommendation to you is embrace it. You gotta embrace the change and take advantage of it. You know, I, many years ago, I heard uh, John, Sisk, John, <laughs> John Chambers talk, uh, CEO of Cisco, and, uh, and he made the comment that always has, that has always stuck to me, and he said, major changes in market share happens, happen at times of change. That was his message, and it, and it, and it has stuck with me, and it, it makes sense. <clears throat> when major changes happen, that's the time that there's a disruption in a marketplace. That's when major market share shifts occur. So you've got to put, make sure that you and your company take advantage of the opportunity that exists. The opportunity that change allows major ch something, something good to happen for you. So it's a chance to leapfrog your competition a major change in an industry. It's a chance to somehow, you know, market share tends to settle out things kind of stay the same, you've got, you've got you know, um, uh, it, it's hard to make shifts. But at a moment of change, that's your opportunity, and so you've got to capitalize that in your business, no matter what the change is and what kind of business you happen to be in. But it's also true on a personal level. On a personal level, it's a chance to make your mark. Because if, you're dep if your company, even when your company says, there's changes happening and we're going to be going in a new direction now, the people around you in your department will say, ooh, I don't believe that change is actually occurring, or I'm threatened by it, or I'm crushed by it, or whatever. They won't make the change. And here's your opportunity to make your mark in your company. If you embrace the change and you say, if this is where we're going, I'm in. No matter where we're going, I'm in. I'm in with two feet. That's your opportunity then to, make a, to set yourself apart from the other people in your, in your company to set your, and to become a fan of that change, to become a... a, a an agent of that change, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Third, so when you're a doer, when, you're a, when you've got this job as a doer and people aren't necessarily that interested in your opinion of the strategic direction of the company, how do you, where, what's your power base? What's your, what's your source of power? Your source of power is, the, is facts. You will find no matter what job you happen to get that you will probably be buried in data. There's going to be reams and reams of data around you, and you will be much closer to that data and to those facts than your boss or your boss's boss or the people above them. Okay, that's your power base, okay? So that when you meet with the vice president and the vice president uh, says, you know, and, and you're having uh, maybe a, you know, a, a quick moment at the, coffee, at the coffee machine, rather than saying, I think we should take a new strategic direction in this company, which he might dismiss, and he might not think that highly of, rather say, I've noticed something that I'm not sure other people have, but you know we've been looking at this business and, it, and we think of it as sort of mediocre in profit. As I went through the details, there's actually pockets within this business that are highly profitable and other pockets that are losing money. And so we're looking at it as being all mediocre, but in fact, there's pockets of high profitability in there, and in there is an insight that can help us grow the profitability of the total business. Whoa. 
I'd like to spend more time with you, he might say. Tell me more about this, this, this uh, thing that you've uncovered. That's your source of power. And so rather than trying to be something that you're not, delve into the facts, get the facts, and that's, what, that's, what, uh, that's how you can influence other people. Okay, so your facts, interestingly, will suddenly trump your boss's opinion. The boss might say, I thought we should be going in this direction, but based on what you just told me, maybe I should reconsider. He just wants to do right for the company. He's not stuck in his opinion. He just has a strategic direction. It's based on a set of assumptions. And you can change his assumptions by ba on the basis of your facts. And then <clears throat> never, ever suppress or bury contrarian data. There's a lot of people that will say, the boss is, the boss is heading us north. North, sorry, that way. Uh, the boss is heading us north. Uh, and so I found some data that says, North is going to, you know, there's, there's actually a cliff. We're going to march over a cliff if we go north. But I better bury that information. I better, I better not show that because that's different than, the than what the company wants to hear. No, that's exactly what the company needs to hear. You need to, you need to if there's facts in your, in, within your purview that, that suggest that we're going in the wrong direction, raise those facts. Help the company to manage those risks by, by raising the facts. Never, er ever bury the stuff that's contrarian because you won't be helping the company to the extent that you could. OK. <clears throat> Point number four, maintain a steep learning curve. Find a way, rather than, um, ma rather than managing your career, managing your career like, oh, let's see, I'm in this job now, and if I went to this other company, I could get a slightly better, better uh, compensation and maybe a little bit better title, and then I might move to that. Don't worry about managing your career and managing how you're viewed. Instead, focus on where can I learn the most? And if you focus on learning, especially early on in your career, to accept new responsibilities that open your mind to new possibilities, that will be a very, very powerful thing. And so I'd encourage you very, very much to, to think about learning rather than managing your career. Uh, because you do need to put yourself in new situations somehow within one company or by moving around that allow you to learn new skills and experience new things. It makes you a more valuable member of a company. And so make sure you're maintaining a steep learning curve. And it was that, <clears throat> as a, along the way of my career, there were certainly other opportunities that came along. And the question I had to ask myself was, can I learn more at this new company or can I learn more where I am? And the conclusion I came to, for me, was that I could actually learn more where I was. That's not the case for everybody. And friends of mine who left P&G did exceptionally well. Uh, and, and, and I did pretty well, too. And so we've all done fine. But you, have to, but you have to think about it through a learning lens rather than thinking about it through managing your career. Um, fifth point is you have a responsibility to help create a positive corporate culture. And um, the culture is about sort of the, the smell of the place. As you walk through a building and you, and you, uh, you see people and you see them interacting and you see how they, how they get along together, what does it feel like? What does it smell like as you're walking through a building? And, we all, and rather than thinking, that's management's responsibility, <clears throat> they're doing a lousy job of creating a positive culture. It's your responsibility. We're all breathing this same air. Okay? Every one of us has a responsibility to that air, and, and we've got to make sure that we're all contributing in a positive way to that culture. And so, so every moment in a career that you're spending your time grousing about what a crappy job somebody else is doing is real downtime. And, and you can spiral down the drain very, very quickly if that's how you spend your day. And rather, if you spend your day building people up, making it a more constructive place to be, uh, people will notice that, they will appreciate it, and you will be a valuable team member. And so <clears throat> make sure that you are somehow finding a way to add your value to the company culture that you're in. You've got to find a way to stay balanced. Um, uh, it is, that, too, is not your boss's responsibility or senior management's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Yeah, they have a responsibility, too, but don't deny the, re the role that you play. Your boss can't be clairvoyant about the fact that you like to go play ultimate frisbee at 4.30 on Wednesdays, and therefore, he shouldn't schedule a meeting then. He can't be clairvoyant about that. If you don't tell him, he's not going to know. 
Okay? So if you're going to maintain some sort of balance, you've got to articulate your priorities to other people so that they know it. And you've got to accept responsibility for the implications of that. <coughs> like, um, you know, first off, what people are going to be measuring is they're going to be measuring the output, not the input. They're going to be measuring the work that you produce, your productivity, not how many hours you're hanging around. Uh, hanging around the office, you know, going out for dinner and coming back to the office and hanging around and chit-chatting, if it's not productive time, who cares? And nobody's going to be noticing anyway. I never honestly noticed which cars were still in the parking lot when I left, and I didn't care, okay? Um, so, and, and you've got to take personal responsibility uh, for the discipline required uh, to be productive. It's not easy being productive. It's, it's easy, it's nice having a chit chat and having a coffee, and it's important sometimes to have a coffee with somebody. <clears throat> but you've got to find a way to be much more productive, to be as productive as you possibly can be, and to accept personal, personal responsibility for the balance that you want to achieve in your life. Um, you will have lots of time, my point number seven is that you'll, you will have lots of time when you will feel, early on especially, like it's an exercise in conformity as you join the workforce that people are trying to make you conform to some sort of a model uh, that you might like and you might not like. And I'll tell you that they're just trying to coach you. Uh, and you can, be, you can stay as weird as possible, as weird as you want, as long as you're performing. What matters is that you're performing on the job and, and uh, uh, conformity isn't really important. But you will find, as you enter the workforce, that you're going to go through a bit of a culture shock. Uh, you, you, you know, for the last... 15 years of your life, you've known what comes next. My daughter is in grade 11. She knows what's next. It's grade 12. Okay? So it's pretty easy to know what comes next, and you know the rules and the mores of, of school life. When you enter the workforce, suddenly it's a bit of a culture shock because it's all different rules and mores and, and different, different rules of operating. And so uh, you'll need to get used to that. And early on, it will feel like, you're, like, like somebody's trying to conform or you're trying to encourage you to conform to some sort of set of rules that you don't really like. Go with it. Go with it and see how you can continue to be yourself within that new world. <coughs> Four, point number eight. How do you tell if somebody's a good leader? Um, can you look across the room and say, oh, that guy must be a good leader. Just look at the way he parts his hair and, and uh, <laughs> look at the way his shoes match his belt or something, I don't know. Uh, you can't tell. You have no way of knowing. Um, and, and leadership skills come in all different types and styles. The only way to tell if somebody's a good leader is to look behind him or her to see if anybody actually follows. And so, so you need to be, from the first part of your career, you need to be the leader that other people would actually choose, because they have a choice. <clears throat> they have a choice to, as to whether they will follow you or not. And you need to be that leader that, that, will, that they will choose to follow. So how, what will they choose on the basis of? Um, they'll choose on the basis of what, what uh, we call the five E's. So the first E is envision. Do you have a vision worth pursuing? Do you, can you articulate a vision that somebody would look at and say, yeah, I, I think I'd like to go there too. You know, I'd like to, there's this, there's, we, you know, we're in this swamp right now, but over the, over the mountain, there's this amazing valley. It's beautiful there. Come with me, okay? So, so do you have a vision that's worth pursuing? Can you engage other people in that journey? Can you get other people to come with you? Okay? It's not easy encouraging other people to come with you. They will have their own vision. So can you articulate your vision so clearly and inspire them to come with you? Can you then energize them for the journey? Can you give them the, the fuel that they need to make it over the mountain and over to, the, to this beautiful valley that you've told them about? Can you enable them for the journey? Can you give them the training that they need? Can you take the barriers out of their way so that, so that they can actually make the journey? They can actually get all the way there. And then finally, in the end, can you execute? Can you get it done? There's a lot of people in business that spend their time going, ready, aim, 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 and they never, ever pull the trigger. And so at some point, you've got to pull the trigger and just go. And, and so 
uh, can you execute? Those things are what will allow you to be a leader that other people choose to follow. And it's up to you whether you can learn those skills. They're imminently learnable. And they're learnable without changing your personality and without having to become something that you're not. You need to be an authentic leader that other people say, yeah, I'm going where he's going, because that makes sense to me. Okay? <clears throat> My ninth point is to go global. Uh, Canada is about just under 2.5% of worldwide GDP. So to limit yourself to Canada only uh, is a mistake. There's, there's, a, there's a lot more out there. Uh, there, there my, as I said earlier, the, the best career move I ever made was when I agreed to, to move with my family uh, over to England for a while and to work there. Uh, because, not because it was England, because it was different than here. Uh, and, it, and it stretched me in ways that, uh, that I needed to be stretched. It, it tested me uh, in ways that I needed to be tested, and, it, and I grew. And I grew as a result. Same thing with my move to the US. It was much more different than I expected it to be, uh, and, and it helped me. It helped me to grow into whoever I have become. And I would encourage you, especially today, to make sure that you don't limit your career choices to something that is you know, <clears throat> southern Ontario only, or you know, Ontario only, or Canada only. Somehow set yourself up for the possibility of learning on a global scale, on a global stage. Okay? Um, that can be true in terms of taking a course abroad to begin with, to start this process. Uh, it can be true uh, in terms of working in a company that might allow you to move internationally at some point down the road. In my case, I didn't move internationally for 15 years. I was 15 years in P&G Canada before I, I left. And I wish I had gone sooner. I really, really wish I had gone sooner because it was great. Uh, and it was great for my, for my family as well. Um, uh, so I would encourage you to at least put yourself in line for the opportunity to, to lead on a global stage. Uh, and you have to think your way through that and you have to do things right now to set you up for that opportunity. What is the, well, who are the global companies, perhaps, that whether their headquarters is in Canada or elsewhere, who are the global companies that you might want to work for and how can you set yourself up for success in that environment? Okay. <clears throat> Now then, the, uh, the last tip I have for your success in my 10 tips is a, is a uh, piece of advice that I got when I was about 25 years old. And my boss took me to hear a, a, uh, a guest lecturer who was from University of Western Ontario. Despite <coughs> the fact that he was from there, he actually had something quite good to say, <laughs> which, uh, and the, and the, the um, I don't remember much of his speech, but I remember one point that he made, and it has stuck with me. <clears throat> that's uh, 32 years ago. It stuck with me all that time. And his, his, uh, his comment was, don't close any doors till you're 45. This was his career advice. And I thought it was a really interesting piece of advice. And the, and the logic goes like this. You start your career when you're around 25, you end your career when you're around 65. 45 is the halfway mark. Don't close any doors until you're half done. So um, that, that comment stuck with me. And so as opportunities presented themselves for me, uh, I would ask myself, does this open doors or does this close doors? That was true inside of P&G, and it was true as I considered opportunities outside of P&G. And it, and, it, and it helped me make the decision as to whether this was a good opportunity or not. There, I saw people in my career who um, early on moved to a much sweeter title at a second-rate company, and then moved from that to an even sweeter title at a third-rate company. And they found themselves in their early to mid-30s maxing out in a company where surrounded by people that they couldn't learn from. And I'm so glad I kept focusing on where can I learn the most and does this opportunity open doors for me or close doors for me? <clears throat> because that served me well as I, as I moved through my life. Now, um, so, now, retiring at 55, 
Well, I'm well past 45, uh, so, so uh, uh, who cares if it closes doors? Uh, I definitely closed the door on P&G, um, but I opened up a whole bunch of new doors that have been uh, rich and rewarding and uh, fulfilling. And so it's, it, I'm having fun so far <laughs> after a year and a half of, uh, of retirement. But that's the tip. Even though it came from University of Western Ontario, I hope you will, you will consider it and think back uh, on this at some point in your career as opportunities present themselves, does this open doors or close them? Okay, so uh, summary of what I've just told you. Set bold goals, embrace change, get the facts because that's your source of power, maintain a steep learning curve, focus on learning rather than focus on your career, uh, help create a positive corporate culture, uh, use the energy and the, your useful enthusiasm to do that, stay balanced, find it, you know, be honest with your boss about what's important to you, and be as productive as you possibly can be that allow you to get to the other things in your life. You gotta perform, not conform. You gotta be the leader that other people choose to follow. Remember, five E's. Uh, and uh, go global, at least consider your, yourself, uh, uh, to set yourself up to, to take advantage of global opportunities and don't close any doors until you're 45. So those are my thoughts and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you've got. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, it, yeah, I, my, my tip would be go anywhere. Not, it's not, I certainly wouldn't limit it to some parts of the world. Um, I, I think you can, you can go anywhere, and I think you need to go where growth is. And right now, uh, growth is not in Western Europe. I wouldn't advise people to, that, that that's the place to go, although it's, it qualifies as being different than here with a different set of challenges. But, but definitely, uh, I would, I would uh, advise people to... Uh, learn about Asia, learn about Brazil, learn about India, um, you know, learn about Russia. Uh, those, are the, those are the places that are growing and so you can put yourself in a good, in, in a good place by, by learning about those countries. Um, uh, so so uh, definitely, uh, absolutely. I had the opportunity at one point in my career, when I was in England, uh, the company asked me to, uh, to go to China and uh, I really, really wanted to go. And, uh, uh, for family reasons, it just, it just couldn't work for us at the time. Um, uh, and so I had to say no, but I said no with tremendous reluctance. And I, I can't, I don't honestly believe in regrets. I don't like regrets, so I can't say that I regret it, but I look at that as a pivotal point that, that, uh, that you know, a missed opportunity, but hey, my, it, it couldn't, couldn't change because of some family stuff. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of them. Um, uh, I think it was a bit of a, um, I think my time in England was, was particularly fun uh, because um, often what happens when you, when you move internationally with a company is that you inherit a mess, right? The reason they're willing to, to spend the money to bring in somebody, paratroop somebody in, is because things are screwed up. And so, uh, so I walked into a situation where the organization <coughs> was, uh, where the results had not been good. Um, the organization was feeling whipped and beaten uh, because they knew the results were bad. Uh, and, um, uh, and so they handed me the reins and said, see what you can do with this. And uh, it doesn't get any more fun than that. I mean, the best thing that the, that the company can give you is a low base. Uh, and so, uh, so that's what I inherited. I had inherited a really low base. And so uh, we, we had the opportunity at the same time, we, we, were, we were in a crummy old building that was a, an R&D lab that had been sort of converted into offices and it was, it was terrible. And, we, and the company had already made the decision to build a new building uh, about hmm, seven or eight kilometers away. And so we had the opportunity with this new building <clears throat> to say, we're building a world-class building. And by the time we move in, we need to have a world-class business that's befitting of that move. And so we started to draw the parallel along the way of, here's the progress on the building. Is the progress on the business matching that or not? And, but we could build momentum and enthusiasm for this transition. We, it was a physical transition, so that, 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 was, that was helpful. Uh, but it was also a, uh, a kind of a, an inspirational transition that we need, we need to change our business. And, and that was particularly fun. 
so, so that was a that was a but there's there's lots and lots of highlights. Um, the progress we made in PNG Canada over the course of uh, 12 years in the job was was great. Uh, we sort of tripled the size of the business in the, in those 12 years. Um, we had a lot of fun doing it. We really changed the corporate culture uh, dramatically and uh, and had a great great team. Um, there's, there's there's lots and lots, uh, but uh, but and it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I did, um, but nothing formal. Um, you know, uh, I uh, I had a couple of mentors, uh, but but it was an informal thing that people that that I just came to know. I I played baseball on the P and G baseball team, and the first baseman was my general manager, and uh, and he and because we shared this love of baseball, um, we got to know each other, and he's still a friend. We golf uh, golf together now. Um, there's, yeah, I, I had mentors along the way, but the formal, men, it's become much more of a, you know, mentorship is good, therefore we must have a formal program for it. It's lost some of the spontaneity and the, the, that, that, that's, that was great. Um, and uh, so I don't know that the formal processes worked as well as the, as the informal. And if you, you know, you can have lots of mentors outside of a company too that can give you advice and, and uh, and I certainly had those as well, and a, and a great group of friends that uh, that have provided uh, support for one another. So, so it doesn't. Ha I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I ever saw the formal mentorship process work well. Uh, I think it needs to. I think it needs to be much more spontaneous and uh, and real uh, than an assignment. Okay, you, you're assigned. You're the mentor now for this guy. Well, okay, but. We don't have anything in common, and we don't really know each other, and so it becomes almost like a, a blind date uh, as you as you meet this person, and it's it's not very uh, it's not as much fun. Uh, yeah, uh, P and G is a unique company in that um, it is promotion from within only. Um, you you do not uh, you can't go to a headhunter and say. I don't really like this crop, so back up the truck and drop off some new ones. Um, you simply can't do that. We choose not to, um, and and so so you um, know, people show up to work every day wanting to do great work, and um, you just need to and and so you just need to help them achieve it. And and if they're not achieving it, yeah, I had to make a couple of changes. I had to move a couple of people. <clears throat> to other roles and a couple of people, you know, that weren't weren't helping create the culture that we wanted, we had to say goodbye to. Uh, but th those are the exceptions, really. Um, it, it was a matter of helping the people that were there see the potential of what they could could do. And uh, and I think it's all too common in business today to say, well, these are the these are the crapola people who created these bad results, so they're gone. Let's bring in a new batch. These are the people who have the institutional knowledge, the, the history of what didn't work, and so to to lose that, that's uh, I, I, you, you can't lose much of that. You need those people that made the mistakes to learn from those mistakes and do things better next time. And we changed very few people. Uh, I think out of the team of perhaps 12 that reported to me, I might have changed two. Uh, and uh, and but the rest of it was just getting people to see the possibilities of what we might do. Yes. They're, they're completely different opportunities today. Um, the demand, uh, I mean, there, there will be probably less companies on the smorgasbord that I described than, than when I w was graduating, uh, perhaps. Um, um, so the demand for your services won't be quite as great. You might not have to beat the companies off with a stick uh, that, you know, when you're graduating. You might, you might find that you only get two offers rather than six. Uh, um, but uh, they're different opportunities. And you need to see the possibility, the range of possibilities, and, and uh, think your way through the new, the, the new reality. Um, and uh, some of that will be in new industries, and some of it will be in old industries. Um, you know, it's, it, uh, I, I think that there's still a tremendous demand out there for talented people that can come in and bring fresh insights to a business and, 
and people that can look through a page, reams and reams of data, and find insight into how to make the business better. And uh, that's what you're being hired to do, especially in the early times. So I think there's lots of opportunity. Uh, most valuable skill. I think the most valuable skill I have and this sounds odd when I've just been talking at you for the last 40 minutes. My most valuable skill is my ability to listen. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the answer uh, to, you don't generally need somebody from outside to come with a new, fresh, breakthrough answer. The answer can be found within your own team. If you, and so you just need to listen to those voices that that, uh, that are around a boardroom table or around a, you know, a conference room table and work with each other to find something, that find a new, better solution. Um, <clears throat> and to make sure that you're seeking out the voice of the person who thinks that their point of view doesn't matter. Uh, you know, the, the quiet person at the table, uh, the person who, um, uh, who who maybe has been suppressing their point of view because it looks like, the, like eight out of the other 10 people in the room all agree on a direction. You need to find a way to seek out that other point of view. That, to me, I mean, early on in my career, it was about listening to consumers. What, does the, what, what are they really telling us? And, and peeling that onion of, the, of, the, of the, what the consumer is really looking for. That was incredibly energizing for me. Uh, but then at other levels, it's listening to the voices inside of your own company. Listen, being open to the point of view of the guy who does come up to, the, to you at the water cooler and says, I think I found something in this data and can I just bend your ear for a couple minutes? Those, those insights, those are fantastic. So being able to listen uh, and find the points of view that might not have been articulated very loudly, that's a wonderful skill. That, that, uh, that has helped me a lot. opened some doors initially. After that, I was on my own. Uh, have I ever referred back to my textbooks or my notes? No. Uh, because, you know, and, 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 and I don't, that's not a derogatory comment at all. You know, what you're doing when you're here <coughs> is you're exercising your mu the muscle of your brain. You know, <laughs> you're stretching your brain in different dimensions. And, and then you're ready to take on new things because your brain has been exercised and it's open to, to new possibilities. Um, that helped me. Both what I learned in, in class, but also what I did when I was not in class. The many other things I got involved in on campus, the extracurricular activities, the things I did in the community when I lived here. Um, sometimes the theory that's discussed in class, um, you get a chance to apply in a campus club, uh, in a summer job, in a community charitable organization, that's, that's, it's the total gestalt of what you get here. That's, that's the power of your education. And you've, you're, you've been exercising your brain. Whether you're in the business school or whether you're in the theology school or whether you're in the music school, you've been exercising your brain. Now you just need to go out and apply that strength, that open-mindedness, that creativity that you've been, that you've been um, exercising for the last several years. That's, that's how it benefited me. <clears throat> not in terms of specific skill sets. It becomes obsolete very quickly. And, and each company does things their own way. It might be slightly different than the way you learned it in school. So think about it generally, not specifically, and I think you'll, it will serve you well. Well, um, why did I retire so early? I, well, because I could. Uh, that, that's a part of it. Um, you know, growing up, London Life used to have all these commercials about Freedom 55. I actually believed it. <laughs> so so, so uh, I wanted to do other things. I had been 12 years in the same job. I had, I had so I've, I, and that's way longer than the norm. Much, much longer than the norm. Um, you know, my, my competitors 
had all, you know, in other consumer goods companies, they'd all turned over many, many times. I'd seen several iterations of the presidents of all the other companies. Um, and even my peers running other countries, I was the, I was the oddity, uh, having stayed in my role that long. Partly because the results were pretty good, um, and uh, partly because I didn't really want to move again. Uh, I was at a different phase of my career. So what am I doing now? <clears throat> well, I think Dr. Kelly explained, I'm, I'm on several boards, uh, and they're all different from one another. I'm the incoming chair for the YMCA of Greater Toronto. Uh, I'm, I'm on the board of Sick Kids Hospital. I'm on the board of Intact Insurance. Uh, I'm taking on a couple of new board positions this summer. Um, I've learned to play tennis. Uh, I'm, I'm golfing more, uh, and I'm traveling more, and having fun. And, and, I've, and I've tried to assemble a different, uh, experiences that are sufficiently different that they each uh, stretch my brain in a new direction. Because uh, it was getting stretched along the same dimension for a long time. And so it's good to, to learn new things and experience new things, and I'm having fun with it so far. Maybe not forever, I don't know, but, for, but I have no plans at this point to go back into the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn them by doing. Um, I think you, you, can, you, can, um, you can learn to be <clears throat> better at, uh, you, 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 can, you learn in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be a, the formal mentorship, uh, I think. Um, the problem for me is that it always just feels a little bit awkward. Um, uh, I, but you can still learn by watching other people, by watching, how, you know, when you hear, when you hear business leaders uh, talk about their vision for their company, are you, are you absorbing that as being, how would I articulate that differently? How, you, know, you really need to think about this stuff and whether it actually, whether, is that motivating me or not? Um, and might I do it differently? I, I, you learn just as much from having a bad manager as you do from having a good one. Um, because you learn a negative example. Oh, I'll never make that mistake. Boy, did he step in it there. Uh, so I, I think there's lots of ways to learn other than just mentorship. Uh, I, if mentorship works for you, wonderful. But it's not a panacea. It's not a be-all and end-all. I think you need to take your learning as a project for you and and find ways to expose yourself to new things and, uh, and, and maintain that steep learning curve. It's your responsibility, not somebody else's. Yes, last one. Yeah, it was a demanding job. Um, uh, it was about a 70 to 80 hour a week job. And, and I did that for 12 years and I, um, you know, you, you, I, how did I do it? I did it, I made a number of choices that helped it be reasonable. I lived about four minutes from the office. That helps. People who commute for an hour and a half each way a day or one way, to, I don't know how they, I, I, that would drive me crazy. And think about the, the difference that makes. Um, my kid's school was uh, pretty close to where my office was as well as a result. And so when my boys would play, you know, a rugby game, a volleyball game, a basketball game or whatever, I could easily get there in the middle of the day, go to an hour of, base, of, their, of their game, and come back to the office. And people knew that was a priority for me. Uh, so I was going to do that. Um, I, uh, work, I, I have always worked out in the morning, not always, I have for the last eight or nine years worked out in the mornings. Uh, so I work out before I go to work. Um, uh, and so that helps. Um, that means you don't have to take away from family time uh, to, to stay physically fit. So you make choices, it's a, so it, but it is a personal discipline. Uh, there is a definite personal discipline required, and, uh, and you give things up. You have to say no to, other, to, to some things, um, and, uh, but it's doable, if you, it's, but it's a choice. It's not for everybody, uh, and, uh, and, it's, it, it's a, and it's not easy, and it's not somebody else's responsibility, it's yours. It's yours to find a way that make, to make that work. Anyway, I'm getting the hook, so thank you. <laughs> yeah.